so the world, we just listened to Noel Quinn talking about inflation, David Solomon on the banking side talking about inflation. How big an issue is inflation for you? Where is it showing most manifest in buyer? Well, Manos, we have seen that uh, there's quite a bit of cost pressure that has come to us, uh, driven by the fact that uh, supply chains have not been as stable as they used to be pre the crisis. So we've seen significant increases in freight rates. Uh, you know, everybody is talking about uh, uh, you know, the charges that we have to take for transatlantic transportation. Uh, we are pivoting uh, to uh, air freight, which uh, is yet even more expensive. But when you have life-saving pro products that need to come to patients and customers, that's what we do. Secondly, we also see uh, a surge in energy prices uh, that is of limited impact for us, but still we feel it in our production. And last but not least, some input materials that are increasing. And what will follow on the heels is for sure uh, labor cost increases that we will see starting 2022. Do you think these pressures are going to rise wages input side? Do you think they're going to continue to rise, Werner, in 2022? Uh, yes, I do think that we will certainly see that uh, you know, when we come to the discussions with the unions, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, merit increases and the like, because people feel the pinch of inflation and cost increases when they go to the store, when they go shopping and the like. Uh, and that will, of course, drive their demand up yeah, in terms of uh, what the annual increase should be. Yeah. It's always a negotiation, but we will not get away with the relatively low increases that we have seen over the last years. What kind of percentage increase do you think you're going to be faced with in 2022? Well, we have seen low, very low single-digit increases over the last few years. I think it's going to be a little bit higher, yeah, but still substantially below 5%, I would hope. Now, part of the ingredients that go into uh, glyphosate, and you corrected me on the pronunciation of it, so I'm grateful for that. The Chinese make 60% of glyphosate. You, you've got the other 40%. Are you capable of ramping up production in 2022, and if so, by how much? Yeah, so uh, our global capacity is about 400 uh, uh, million gallons, uh, 300 million gallons per year. Mm -hmm. That's what we can produce. Uh, we produce at capacity currently because uh, Chinese supplies, as you mentioned, uh, uh, are not available for a number of reasons right now, and that provides for significant tightness in the market. On top of that, uh, we have been hit by um, you know, some outages with uh, Hurricane Ida mm -hmm. hitting Louisiana, so we had a plan and stands still for about five weeks that uh, we uh, have brought back on stream, but we lost five weeks of manufacturing volumes that would have come out of that plan, which contribute to the tightness of the market uh, that we see right now. How much of an advantage? I mean, Syngenta was rolled into uh, China Natural Chemical Corporation. They're getting ready for a listing. But how much of an advantage, how much of a competitive threat is Syngenta to you then in China? Well, Syngenta is a very formidable competitor of ours, you know, so one of the top three companies globally. Uh, they have their strength in terms of you know, some of the technologies that they have. Uh, they are very strong crop protection, but also a fertilizer mm -hmm. company in an area that we don't play in. And at the same time, if you look at uh, our business, uh, it is a technology leader in many, many fields. And we do find ways to bring our technology also to mainland China. We are with partnerships, yeah, so not as a fully integrated company mm -hmm. like the way that uh, Syngenta can operate in China, but certainly through partnerships that, uh, that we are working on. Look, we're in Singapore. We're, we're on our way to China, and we are debating uh, China-U.S. global relations. Um, how much more can you do in China? How much more expansion can you do in Asia? And if so, which area of the business? So, so Bayer has historically been a company that uh, you know, sees himself sees itself as being in the middle of the community as a good corporate citizen, mm -hmm. and that's also what uh, you know, the reputation of the company is in China. Yeah? So very early on, uh, when the Chinese government embarked on your know, healthcare uh, and bringing healthcare yeah, to a broader part of the population with their Going West program very early on in the 90s, we were an instrumental partner, and we have been that partner ever since. Yeah? Which also means that in terms of uh, you know, bringing new, better pharmaceutical products uh, that go beyond catering to some of the basic needs of the population. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are in a sweet spot here because we happen to be one of the top three, four pharmaceutical companies in China. What a sweet spot in that. I'm, I'm curious to get your perspective. I know that you've committed to the one buyer, the three legs, the consumer, the pharma, and the chemicals, but I look at what GE has done. I look at what Glaxo has done. Why are you still so convinced of the model that you have at the moment? 
So we have, over the last 20 years, pursued a strategy of becoming a focused multi-business business. business. Yeah, so we shared a lot of businesses that were not driven by science. Uh, and uh, the areas that we've been focusing on is actually the life sciences. If you look at our portfolio today, uh, we are active in three businesses. It's pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. it's crop science, and it's our consumer health business. All of them are informed by you know, the life sciences as a platform, and we do see significant advantages of running those three businesses together under one roof. But the market is deeply discounting you. But, you know, post Monsanto, you're still worth 50% less than you were in isolation. Is there at any juncture a, a consideration, Manus, there is merit in discussing a breakup? Well, Manus, there's always merit in looking at all the options that are out there, but then you know, the conclusion yeah, mm -hmm. that uh, would then follow is after due analysis, what is the right thing for the company to do? And what's right for one company is not necessarily the right thing for the other company to do. And where I'm sitting and with the discussions that we have had also over the last 12 months, quite frankly, we have decided as a board of management and also endorsed by our supervisory board that we are going to continue the course which is developing our company along the three pillars that we have, pharmaceuticals, crop science, and consumer health. And when it comes to the stock price, I think people don't see the underlying value uh, in the company because we do continue to have that, hang, that overhang uh, from the glyphosate litigation. It doesn't have anything to do with the structure of the company. I think the biggest issue is the glyphosate litigation overhang. How that do you is get rid of there. that overhang? How do you convince the investment community that's gone? Well, we are uh, you know, just a few weeks away from a first discussion of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. uh, whether to take uh, our appeal in the Hardeman case, uh, that may make a difference. I think we still need to communicate maybe a little bit more intensively on what we have done in providing for a downside scenario that is totally transparent to our investor community and that has also been provided for in the balance sheet. So from that perspective, it is a clean and good stock to invest to and people you know, should now focus and pivot to looking at the underlying strength of our businesses.